This is Matthew Holt with Healthcare Blog. I'm talking with Murit Garg. He is the CEO of Coventus, which is a relatively new analytics company working in the hospital space. Uh, today, Murit, you raised 30 million bucks from Bessemer and some other wealthy folks in the VC area. So congrats on that, taking you about 43 million overall in the last year or so. So before we start about how you're gonna spend all that lovely money, tell me a bit about what Coventus actually does. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for having me, Matthew. Um, so Qventus, our product is an AI and machine learning product that helps hospitals and health systems run more efficiently, so manage their operations more efficiently in real time. So if you think of, if, if you've been to a health system or a hospital, you'd see the thousands of non-clinical decisions that are happening throughout the day. So even for being in an emergency department, anticipating if you want to run out of capacity, what's going to happen, Doing these decisions ahead of time often makes a big difference. And excellent managers, managers who are really, really good, will tend to proactively anticipate these problems and get ahead of it. But unfortunately, these same managers also have a ton to do. So these things slip through the cracks. So our product learns and sort of develops similar intu intuition to those managers and nudges them and gets them ahead of these decisions. All non-clinical decisions in areas like managing the flow of patients through the emergency department, things like inpatient length of stay, operating room, and now more recently, also primary care access and pharmacies in the, in the hospital setting as well. Okay, well, everyone's forever said that hospitals are big, complicated organizations which have a lot of problems and they have to manage a lot of things that are still on that clinical, uh, on that sort of clinical, non-clinical boundary you talk about. Mm -hmm. All the things you mentioned are, are have a big impact down the road clinically. Uh, there has been a lot of stress, obviously, in recent years about trying to figure out how to improve clinical outcomes and clinical care and all the stuff about readmissions that hospitals have been facing. Have you found that, uh, I know you were in, in consulting a bit before you, you got into this game, have you found that uh, the, there's been a lack of sort of interest or lack of understanding of the issues or the non-clinical stuff? Good question. I mean, there's certainly a much lower appreciation for it outside in, right? Because as a consumer, you rarely get to see what happens um, inside or how the kind of the quote unquote sausage making takes place, but sometimes it's for the better, better, but um, uh, there's definitely less understanding that way. But there's also been a huge change within the industry. If you think of the last four or five years, what's happened is um, we had a tremendously higher amount of pressure on the pricing uh, of all kinds of healthcare services. In the past, every time that has happened two decades ago, three decades ago with the HMO, there was always something that was cross subsidizing that. There's nothing this time that's cross-subsidizing that. So that's increased the focus on the efficiency uh, regardless across health systems. But that's actually been fairly different from four to five years ago to now even, where it is now a top board level topic for almost every health system we speak with. So let's talk a bit about the data that comes into this. A lot of data in different parts of hospitals. And of course, in the last four or five years as well, the average hospital has put in Many of them are putting new technology, especially the EMR. Um, there's been a lot of questions that now we put in the EMR, what do we do with the data? Where is your data coming from? I mean, a bunch of different sources, I'm assuming, that, 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 that are impacting the decisions you're making or helping to make. But right. where's the data coming from? Where you find the most useful sources of data? Great question. So let me give you an example of one of the recipes that might our software might be triggering, and then I can walk you through the examples of data that might go into that. That'll help illustrate it better. But... Um, first of all, like our data comes from the existing source of data that exists in some form or shape. So the existing systems of record, right? So sources of truth that exist. EMRs are one common example of that. Staffing, billing, other systems are other examples of that. Um, we, um, so let's take one example. Uh, emergency department, hopefully you haven't had to wait in the waiting room, but I know it, it, at some point in life, uh, we all have to. Um, it happens right here. <laughs> Um, and then what often is a very hard thing in that case is you wonder what is going on. Very often you'll see um, patients are waiting uh, in the emergency department to get a bed and therefore someone's waiting in the waiting room to get inside the emergency department and that ripple through effect keeps happening um, very regularly. The excellent managers, what they do is they will try to anticipate these situations, but it, it becomes hard. It often doesn't get, they often don't realize quickly enough. Our system is doing things like it's saying, okay, you know, it's Monday after Thanksgiving, Dr. Smith is working today and he tends to order more labs and our labs are really slow today and my ICU is completely filling up and based on the patients I've already are seeing are in the waiting room, I'm going to run out of physical capacity in the next two to three hours. And then it'll message people and get them together and suggest a set of things they can do. 
So in that scenario, there are both data sources that are coming from, you know, let's say in this case, the EMR, wherever when you, when you came in, I would have said, okay, Matthew, you're, I'm registering you, got it, like 9 a.m., I got that. Hey, Matthew, you're in room uh, ED1A, okay, that was at 9.05. Hey, this doctor picked you up, that's at this time. So all of that stuff's coming through, that's the data that we are getting. But along with that, learning that, hey, after Thanksgiving, we seem to, seem to have a much higher volume of patients coming in. This type of patient, when, when this type of doctor sees them, this is what happens. So we pick up a lot of that from secondary sources. And then things like the weather and other pieces that are non, not inside the hospital at all that do end up in some cases making a big difference. So we pick up sources like that. And, um, and sometimes actually sources, um, uh, there's a, you might have heard this, but I did not know it when we first started back four or five years ago. One of, the, one of the nurses we first talked about this with said, hey, did you take the full moon into account? For and, sure. And I was like, all, all is the case. Right, exactly. And I, I, had to, I had to head scratch a little bit. Didn't know if he was pulling my leg or being serious, but turns out he was being serious. Um, we did pull it in, but it didn't make a difference for what it's worth uh, to clarify that one. But, but we have the whole gamut of sources of data like that. So. so in terms of actually how this thing gets transmitted, is this text messages to the phone? What's the, the user interface? I mean, we hear a lot about analytics and dashboards sitting with the hospital at the CFO and the COO, but this is starting to be much more on the ground. Um, for yeah, and that was actually a very important part of the lesson for us as we, as we went about building the company. I mean, I, my first belief was, hey, giving people data back would help a lot. And, but I quickly saw when you get busy, when you and I get busy, you have no time to log into a dashboard, look at what it's saying, to open the report, to understand the graph, and to figure out what to do. That takes a lot of effort, especially if when you get really busy. Honestly, even just predicting, that's not good enough. Like uh, a prediction distribution is 30% chance this, 40% chance that. Figuring out what to do based on that and to do it, again, a lot of cognitive load, lots of effort, and it makes it really hard to make sense of it. So our product basically, we know that our users, many of the folks who are trying to make these decisions, they're running around, they're not in one place. For some decisions, it makes a lot of sense to reach them where they are, not wait for them to log in. So our product will predict and recommend certain things, but then look at all the costs and benefit of the options they have in front of them so that there's less sort of load in the moment to think through things and then reach out over secure message, text messages, things like Vocera, other things. And, um, or in some cases for some decisions, it makes sense actually to make the change itself. And in those cases, it'll make the change, but the whole spectrum of decisions exists ranging from ones where you have low downside risk or high confidence to ones where, um, the next step requires more human intervention. And depending on that, we are really, really laser focused on meeting the user where the best sort of mechanism for them is. So you sit in the background and they get a text message or they get a, a hint to, to, that they should do something or something gets made and, and away, away they go. So um, I can imagine, you know, this, this sounds great in theory. Then you have to take it to a hospital and say, okay, this is great. I'm going to give you money. What's the ROI on this? So how, tell me a bit about that journey as to getting those first few clients, understanding, you know, how to make this thing, figure out if the full moon made a difference or not. And then, and then getting to that ROI calculation so that it actually makes sense to have, you know, to spend the money on you. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's actually one of the reasons we focused a lot of our, um, our ML efforts on these operational use cases, because no matter what happened, um, regardless of regulatory changes, regardless of what regime came in place, these things drove efficiencies and benefit to the same actor who's buying. Right, like it doesn't in, in our healthcare system. Unfortunately, there's lots of funny flows of money where the person who might benefit sometimes is not the one who can pay for it, and then then those benefits don't actually come to life. So in our case, in majority of the cases, that is not the case. We can we can actually drive that improvement by the same person for the same person who's paying for it. So for example, length of stay. Let's look at inpatient length of stay. Huge problem. Um, inpatient length of stay or patient flow by itself is it was estimated to be over 100 billion dollars of waste. Right? So when a patient is staying an unusually long amount of time, more than they're clinically needed to. For a single health system, that can be 10 to $15 million of excess cost. So a patient who was in the ICU or in the step-down unit could have gone home if you got the MRI in time, but the MRI department was backlogged and we didn't know which ones were very important. Or um, that a patient who could have gone to the skilled nursing facility, but we didn't know that that was the case and now the family needs a few days to decide. Things like that that end up, uh, end up adding up. So that's kind of the one side of the ROI equation, uh, the financial side of it. But there's also uh, two other sides of this equation that are really important. So for one of our early health systems, for example, by doing this, the hospital was able to take out 
almost a million minutes of patient wait time in their ED, which is for that community, it was a community with two hospitals in the town, made a huge difference. They could access the care, they could get there, they could get there faster uh, and made a huge difference. And then lastly, for the providers, the, the nurse manager of that ED often talks about how her staff always felt before that they were behind a, a step or two behind and never enjoyed one month or two months after someone coming and saying, these metrics don't look good. Why the heck, right? No one does that. No one enjoys that. She's like, now I feel like I can shape these events when they're happening, before they're happening and actually make a difference. And that gives me a lot more empowerment in my, in my job as well. So we certainly have to make sure it's financially viable and it's beneficial, but, but I think equally important are the other stakeholders of the patient and provider. Uh, otherwise things don't actually come to be and actually don't come to uh, work. So that makes a lot of sense, that sort of whole view of looking at it. Now let's flip, flip a little bit to the, to the business side of what you're doing. Um, obviously, uh, you've impressed somebody. I know uh, Norwest and, and uh, Mayfield were involved for investments in there with, now with uh, a New York Presbyterian. Is that one of your investors as well? Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Dodger Peter Fleischer is still one of my staff members, Graham Mossy. I haven't oh, there you go. <laughs> Graham's there too now. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you run into him yet. But, but give oh. me a sense. So now you have... Uh, Give me a, where are you in the number of hospital customers you have and where do you need to get to, to, to get best of their money back? <laughs> yeah. Um, depends on how much they want. Right. Um, but, um, I suspect a lot. We yeah. might guess. I'm, I'm no expert. In this. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think for us right now in the last few years, we've probably, um, helped or enabled in some way about 3.8 million patient encounters. We had about 60 plus hospitals, which, you know, a few years ago was, was, um, probably single digits. Um, so we've grown a fair amount, but the growth has come in both in forms of um, new customers coming and using our product, but also existing customers saying, hey, I can, this, so many pieces of healthcare delivery are process driven. And so many of the gaps are lack of consistent, and reliable execution of process that I can apply this not only in the ED, but also in the OR, not only the OR, but also in inpatient on the state, not only in that, but in, in pharmacies and in, in our patient access and hopefully eventually to, to urgent care and other places beyond that. The other piece, I think that's, um, to, as in looking forward, one of the other unique things uh, from a health IT standpoint for us is, unlike many of the businesses, that, as I was saying, that might be based on the funny way money flows in the US, um, this is wherever you deliver care, you have these, these issues and these benefits to gain from. So I think there's a, there's a fairly sizable pull globally as well to solve issues like these. And so that'd be another piece for us to focus on going forward. Okay, well, you're kind of hitting at my next question, which is, uh, now you've, now you've kind of proved it out. You've got a bunch of customers, you're, you're getting some ROI, and now you've uh, obviously got some expansion plans. Uh, sounds like more of the same, but in more places, or more in the same places and more in different places in terms of uh, you know, the same product. Is there something in your arsenal that, um, you, or something you could add to your arsenal to sell to the same clients that you're thinking about? Are there other areas where you're either gonna expand, build, acquire, um, or is this mostly around, a, 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 you know, increasing the scale of your operations? So the increasing the scalability of operations by itself is fairly, fairly broad, right? So right now, let's take patient flow as one of the core offerings that we do. We're gonna keep doubling down on that and keep expanding on that. I mean, in patient length of stay alone, a problem is big enough to sort of um, make a sizable difference in the healthcare system. But we've also, um, as I mentioned, recently started helping primary care access. How do you help drive that? Um, Similar problem from an operations standpoint, completely different setting. Or how do you help drive um, pharmacies? So those are examples of places. Similarly, you can imagine many, many, many other areas that we can start applying it to. What we do usually is we have customers, existing customers who we work with in new use cases. And so we'll be keeping on doing that. Our customers usually see us as an enterprise system of action across all these ClinOps use cases, so clinical slash operational use cases, not driving clinical decision-making, but actually where we know what to do, but we need to do it consistently and reliably across a whole, whole spectrum of use cases. And we, um, we have to do the right balance of taking not too many use cases on, of course, because um, each of these use cases require really sort of judicious design around how to make both the data, the predictability, the workflow, and the outcome work together. So we have a new use case team that works on that. So that'll be a fair amount of focus for us as well. Um, but I think even in our existing use cases in expanding those in new customers, there's a lot to do still. So talking about what to do, I hear that growing a company can be a bit of a bit, a bit of a prop, pro, you know, work in progress and can be problematic. Uh, how many people are you now? How many people do you think you're going to be in a year's time? And 
Who and what do you need? Yeah, everything. A lot of things. Um, we're roughly about 75 people right now. Um, I mean, I, I don't always enjoy the metric of like how many people will be because ideally it'll be 75 and we'll be doing, uh, we'll be helping 10 times more patients and patient encounters. I think but, Google added 7,000 people last quarter, just to give you a hint. Yeah, exactly. So, but I know that that's... Maybe some AI too, somewhere in there. <laughs> right. And, uh, but I know that's not feasible. My suspicion is we'll at least grow by, um, by 40 to 50 people in the next six to nine months. Um, we need all kinds of people. The obvious answers are, of course, data science and engineering and product. Uh, but also a really important part of our focus is customer success because uh, in healthcare in particular, the operationalization of these products is, is oftentimes far more important than the product itself. So that's a big area of focus for us. Um, our, um, but that's an area that actually we scaled before we scaled uh, any of our go-to-market teams uh, in the beginning of the company. Um, that's another area I think we have, um, how do we help change people's mindset to to uh, approach operations probabilistically versus not as a set of roles around that too. So as I said, pretty much if you know good people, we, we would love to, uh, we would love to talk to them. Uh, somebody watching this may even, may even be interested in uh, picking, up, picking up the phone, I'll send you an email right now. Um, okay, so I mean, last question is, you know, you, you're, you're on the hot seat, you've, uh, you, this is always a great day for a company where you announce a really big round. On the other hand, it's a day where you've now committed your, ma you've mailed your colors to the mask and you, <laughs> you have some commitment. So uh, when you were sitting in those quiet conference rooms on Silicon and uh, down on, down on Sand Hill Road, um, what, what, what did you say and what do you think, what do you think realistic is going to be? You have said about 60 hospitals now. Where do you think you're going to be in, uh, in a couple of years' time? What, is, what does good look like where you can come back and say, yeah, we spent the money wisely, it was success, and we really made a difference with you know, that, that number of hospitals? Give me a sense about how much you're expecting to grow. Yeah, so I think like first and most foremost about like what good looks like is consistent delivery of outcomes, right? Like um, none of the growth will happen or sustain or continue if that doesn't continue. And that doesn't um, sort of expand as well. So that's like the number one focus from an outcome standpoint. How do we how do we drive outcomes at current and new customers constantly and consistently and reliably as well? And that's hard because there's lots of pieces to it. But not everything is in our control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that's that's really core to what we want to do. Um, from a from a growth standpoint, um, I think what, uh, my hope and our suspicion is that I think in the next um, uh, two years to be able to drive roughly about 15 million sort of patient encounters or enable them in some way. Um, hospitals are a little- So you're at three or so now? 3.8 roughly, yeah. Okay, so you're looking to go about five times in patient encounters at least. Yeah, and it's a little tricky because like, you know, hospitals, um, we might be in one hospital, but we might be touching like many more. Um, so so that's, a, that's a metric that's oftentimes a little easier for us to measure. All right, well, that's, uh, Ambitious enough, but I suspect you are, you're going to have to be. So, uh, yeah. uh, wish you wish you luck in this. It's very interesting. Obviously, hidden hidden area where there's a, a lot of need, a lot of help. Um, I've been talking with Gug. He is the CEO of Cuventus, which, as uh, we mentioned today, is uh, announcing a, a B round of thirty million today in that hospital operations uh, and uh, artificial intelligence for operate <laughs> hospital operations space. So, uh, congrats on the round. Look forward to seeing how this goes over the next uh, few years. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Matthew, and um, thanks for having me.